Okay. I'm hearing a lot of background. Maybe someone has muted or something. Okay. Shall I get started? Can you see my screen, Sam? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, terrific. Um, great. Well, thank you so much again for the for the invitation and opportunity. Um, so today, you know, I'm going to talk about and focus quite a bit of my talk on this cell that you see here, microglia, our resident myeloid cells, macrophages in the brain. And these cells really have emerged as central players, both in normal development and in brain homeostasis. But compared to other cell types in the brain, especially other glial cell types, we still know remarkably little about their normal functions, which is really key if we're to understand how these cells go awry in disease and how they may be communicating with other cell types as well as uh, in the periphery and within the brain. So, you know, our work over the last decade or so or more have really focused on the role of these cells in the context of synaptic remodeling and brain wiring. So today what I'd love to be able to do is sort of take you through some of that data, um, understanding some of the the mechanistic questions about how it is these cells are communicating with neurons and synapses, what are the immune molecules they use to, to signal with, with, with neurons. And in particular, as you'll hear today, um, that a lot of the work in our normal developmental context is providing insight into uh, pathological synapse loss and cognitive decline in a lot of disorders ranging from neurodevelopmental disorders and neuropsychiatric disorders to diseases of the aged brain, like Alzheimer's disease. And although, of course, these diseases and disorders are quite different with respect to age of onset and particular clinical phenotypes, what we're learning as a field is that there are some converging biology and converging mechanisms that I think really kind of come down to, to these cells, these brain resident myeloid cells. And so, you know, the concept of immune privilege in the brain and the central nervous system is really evolving. You know, it's increasingly clear that neuroimmune interactions help shape and sculpt brain development and homeostasis, but can also drive pathogenesis in, in disease contexts. And in particular, you know, if you think about the microglia, we now appreciate they make up about eight to 10% of the cells in the brain, generally speaking, differences in different brain regions and species. And one of the roles that we and others now have uncovered is that these, um, these cells in particular are intimately associated with, with uh, axons and dendrites and in particular synapses. Um, and so they are critically important in helping to sculpt these circuits during development. And although largely I'm gonna focus on the brain resident or parenchymal microglia, in the context of this seminar series, I thought I would just kind of kind of put this into the larger perspective that we have been focused largely on the brain resident microglia cells, but in no way are these the only macrophages in the brain. Um, there are a lot of populations of, of border related macrophages that, that reside in the perivascular spaces, in the meninges, in the choroid plexus, for example. And, and the field and more and more, especially with single cell sequencing are starting to better define the states and functions of these other border related macrophages as well. For the purpose of today's talk though, I am gonna focus a bit more on microglia, but some of the same approaches and, 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 and biology that I tell you about may also be relevant to some of these other populations as well, is that they are representing kind of an interface between peripheral signals in the brain. And ultimately those signals at the borders can then be communicated either directly or indirectly to microglia, which then can communicate to other cell types, either in a local way or even in a more global way, depending on the context. But really what I want to do is start off the beginning of my talk focused on development, because as a developmental neurobiologist, that's really how I came into this. Um, I was not in, my immunologist by training in any way, but been largely interested in understanding how the non-neuronal cells of the brain, the glia cells in particular, help sculpt developing brain circuitry. Now, in particular, we've been interested in understanding uh, this process called synaptic pruning or synaptic elimination, which during development is a normal process and with, by which extra or excessive synaptic connections um, are permanently removed um, while others get strengthened and maintained. This idea of use it or lose it, um, this process of synaptic pruning is really important uh, in, in, in brain development. And, um, and defects in this synaptic refinement or pruning are thought to underlie uh, neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disorders. 
But um, the big question, of course, is, um, you know, what are the mechanisms that regulate this process of pruning? And now there are many mechanisms, and I'm only going to cover a couple today that relate to microglia and immune cells. But I also wanted to highlight the fact that this process of synaptic pruning or synaptic refinement is happening in different critical periods throughout development across species. So in a human, this can happen over the first you know, 18 years of life or more. Um, in a mouse, it's really happening over the first you know, month or, or so of life. But the other take home here is that you know, different circuits and different brain regions tend to refine and prune at different periods based on these critical periods. So what I'm showing you here is an image of the human cortex by Hutton Loker and others. Use, they use Golgi standing just to show, to show this sort of sparsity of connectivity early in development. Then you get this exuberance of synaptic connectivity. And then during different critical periods, you can get this refinement. Uh, in the human, there are areas like the prefrontal cortex and areas involved in executive function that continue to prune and refine all the way up into uh, late adolescence and early adulthood, whereas sensory systems like the visual system tend to refine uh, much earlier in life. And this is all in the human, from the human studies, I think this idea of brain development and refinement is really beautifully illustrated here uh, in this um, decade-long longitudinal brain imaging study using uh, MRI imaging that followed a cohort of, of young kids uh, all the way through into this, uh, this first couple of uh, decades of life. And what I'm trying to show here is that there are regions like the prefrontal cortex that continue to mature all the way into uh, like early adulthood. Uh, and so again, depending upon when you look and where you look, um, you know, there may be def different mechanisms in place, and obviously this could also uh, lead to particular vulnerability and, and disease, and, and may also explain, uh, in, for example, why that there are certain um, periods of development that might be particularly more vulnerable to some disorders. For example, adolescence is known to be a vulnerable developmental period for neuropsychiatric and mental illnesses. And it may be related to the fact that these higher order executive uh, areas and executive function continue to mature and refine into these later time periods in development. So while plasticity is largely thought to be a good thing, right? It enables you to, to learn and, and to these connections to be able to, um, to form based on experience, this plasticity could also lead to vulnerability. Now, a number of years ago, Erwin Feinberg, for example, proposed the pruning hypothesis of schizophrenia that was largely based on some of these anatomical studies that I just showed you, paired with some non other imaging and other studies from human data, and his own work uh, where he was measuring sleep wave amplitude changes across development, and noted, uh, shown here on the left, that there's really striking changes in synapse numbers or decrease in synapse numbers, as well as these sleep changes that are happening in this adolescent window which is right around the onset of disorders like um, uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, and others. And he proposed, without really any hardcore data to support the idea, that the notion that maybe aberrant pruning, either too many or too few, are being uh, pruned during this window, and that could underlie some of these disorders. But of course, what are the mechanisms and the molecules? Nobody really knew. So this hypothesis, while in uh, very provocative at the time, laid dormant for a number of years. But there has been data in, from human studies over the years that support this pruning hypothesis of schizophrenia. Um, for example, work by Glanz and Lewis, uh, Dave Lewis's lab has also shown from post-mortem analysis of those individuals with schizophrenia, some of them at least, have a sparsity or a decrease in these spines uh, in the prefrontal and other brain regions compared to controls. But the problem with a lot of these um, studies, including other MRI studies that show this sort of decrease or cortical thinning during this period is really, is it cause or consequence, right? When do these defects emerge? And ultimately, what are the mechanisms? And this is really hard to study in human data and human tissue, especially post-mortem that, that would usually represent many years after the onset of these, um, the onset of the, of the disorder. And so this is really where over the last uh, decade or so or more, where genetics has been really powerful because emerging genetics more and more is pointing to uh, a number of uh, genes and loci. Um, and because of the sheer number of people that have been sequenced in these case control studies of schizophrenia, 
over 240 significant sites have been identified. And I just want to point over to this particular peak here. This is the MHC locus of chromosome six, where you can see a very strong signal that continues to, to remain the highest peak in the Manhattan plot and work that have continued to emerge uh, more and more implicating the synapse, right? Essentially genes and molecules involved in synaptic development and function, including channels and receptors, but also for the focus of my talk today, um, emerging genetics are also pointing to um, genes that were are traditionally associated with the innate immune system. Um, in particular, the complement cl cascade, classical complement cascade. So I wanna highlight the work of my colleague, Steve McCarroll, uh, who has really his lab a number of years ago in a pioneering study and work led by Ashwin Sekar, an MD PhD student with Steve a number of years ago, when uh, fine mapped uh, and, and identified importantly, that a large uh, percentage of the signal in this MHC locus that I mentioned could be explained largely by genes uh, of the complement cascade, complement C4. Now humans express two C4 genes, C4, a and C4B, and depending upon the haplotype one has, meaning what they've discovered is that those individuals that express multiple copies of the form of C4, C4A, have significant increased risk of schizophrenia. And also um, by, by mapping some of this with uh, expression data from the brains of these individuals showed that those individuals that have multiple copies of C4A versus B also make more C4 in the brain and in the nervous system. And so that was associated with more risk. Now, early days when they first um, started to make these important um, discovery, uh, we started collaborating with Steve and also uh, Mike Carroll, who's a wonderful and uh, talented immunologist at Harvard Medical School that's been studying complement his whole career, including C4. And the three groups started getting together and started um, to think about what could explain or what, what might, um, what might uh, underlie this in terms of the biology. And my lab uh, has been studying uh, the role of complement in the co context of synaptic pruning for a number of years. And so I wanna take you through some of that work, both uh, the historical work that began in my group, but also some of the collaborative work that we're doing together to try to understand um, what might underlie some of the genetic, um, this genetics, important genetics uh, discovery made by Steve McCarroll's lab. And I should say, we're still at the beginning of our understanding of this. But I think uh, this is an example of how one can bring together the emerging genetic data with some biology um, in the context of neuroimmune interactions. So when I was a postdoc uh, at, that number of years ago with Ben Barris at Stanford, we unexpectedly uncovered a role for the classical complement cascade in the developing brain. And, it's, and one of the functions that these immune molecules, these secreted immune molecules play in the context of normal developmental pruning, which I mentioned at the beginning is a, is a process that's important for, for normal brain wiring. And what we discovered was although immunologists and many have been studying complement in the context of the immune system and the in innate immunity in other tissues, including the periphery, the idea that these complement molecules are normally essentially eat me signals that would target a pathogen or an apoptotic cell that would then be recognized by circulating macrophages, what we uncovered was that a lot of these complement molecules, including C1Q, C3, C4, are actually also expressed by resonant glial and neurons in the, in the, in the healthy brain. So they're not all coming from the periphery, but they're expressed by these different cell types. And at the protein level, we noticed that um, complement molecules were also localizing to these developing synapses. This is just a high resolution or imaging to show immunohistochemically, you can, you can localize a lot of the different complement molecules to these synaptic elements, especially uh, during development in these different periods of critical periods where there's this synaptic pruning going on. Now in the mouse, we've, uh, we've been studying this in the context of the visual system where uh, that's a system and a circuit that we use as our model system because a lot's known about synaptic pruning. And what we went on to show, um, work that began at, in Ben Barris's lab, but then I continued in my own lab, was that mice that lack either C1Q, C3, or CR3, the phagocytic receptor on microglia that recognize complement, in fact, the only cell type in the healthy brain that expresses CR3 are, are these microglial cells. What we showed is if you genetically delete any of these components of the cascade, this uh, led to a defect in synaptic pruning um, and that was sustained. Uh, and again, using the visual system as the model system. 
And so we started wondering, you know, how might this relate to the C4 genetics? And this is what led to some of the ongoing work and our collaborations with Steve McCarroll and Mike Carroll and others uh, in the Conti Center that, uh, that we're part of. And what we went on to show in that same uh, paper that I highlighted, a. Ashwin Sekar's paper, that C4 is similarly expressed in human neurons, in the both in culture and in the human brain. And then we also noticed a similar kind of punctate labeling of complement C4 along the processes of these human neurons. And so that raised the question of whether, you know, complement C4 could also be involved in synaptic pruning. And using a similar approach, the visual system of a mouse, we show that in C4 knockout mice, these mice similarly phenocopied the other complement knockout mice and failed to prune properly their synaptic circuits in the visual system. So that was a proof of concept that C4 was part of this classical complement cascade that's involved in synaptic remodeling. But now the question is, do increase C4, which is what the genetics were um, showing us, could that lead to excessive synaptic pruning? Or what are the functional consequences of having too much of a good thing in this case? So this is now ongoing work, but I wanted to share with you some of the work um, over the last year or two that have been, uh, some of it has been recently published, just to show you kind of the way we're approaching this um, through this collaborative effort in our Conti Center and, and work that's ongoing at the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research and across the labs of Bernardo Sabatini, Mike Carroll, Steve McCarroll, and my own group, where we really kind of together started tackling this question. This involved making new tools and new, approach, new ways to be able to interrogate the genetic uh, sort of uh, pathways like complement, but also um, together starting to broaden out the perspective to think about other ways um, in which the genetic um, sort of, uh, work is starting to nominate new underlying biology. So one of the approaches that Mike Carroll's lab took was to generate a new mouse model or a tool that introduced the human C4A allele, this was the risk gene, into a mouse genome using back um, DNA transgenesis. And what was really nice about this model is you can take a knockout on the background of a C4 knockout mouse, they generated mice, based on the crosses, for example, that expressed multiple copies of, this, of the risk um, uh, form, C4A, um, versus the uh, control, and also not shown here, C4B, which remember is the, the form that did not increase risk of schizophrenia, and then asked, what are the consequences of that? And did a lot of validation. This work was recently published uh, just in the last um, six months to a year now. And what they showed is quite exciting, which is that increased um, copy number of C4A led to an increased uh, or enhancement of synaptic pruning, both in the visual system of a mouse and also in other areas like the prefrontal cortex, which is the reverse of what happens when you don't have C4. So lack of C4, fail to prune, now we're showing too many copies of the risk gene leads to over pruning, which was the hypothesis going in based on the fact that there's more C4 expressed in these animals. And so now we're in a position to start to really try to dissect out mechanisms even further and to try to better understand what the consequences are at the circuit level, at the behavioral level, and also um, mechanistically what's regulating C4 and the specificity uh, by C4A versus C4B, for example. So this really brings us to sort of the fundamental questions my lab's been interested in for, for many years now is to try to get at this question of specificity, right? To prune or not to prune, right, is the question. And I think what's to me most interesting about um, some of the work that's, um, that's, that's emerging is that microglia, although they're resident phagocytes, they can prune when there's injury or something like a challenge, but there's a remarkable specificity in terms of which synapses or which circuits they are essentially uh, recognizing. They miss their, their, suggest, their instructive cues that are telling microglia to prune certain synapses or certain circuits versus others. And we really wanna better understand what those cues are. So what we had shown a number of years ago, and this is work by Dorothy Schaefer, who was a postdoc in my lab a number of years ago, we she decided to ask the question, okay, are they just the cleanup crew that are engulfing sort of synaptic debris or the garbage that's sort of left behind, or are they more actively engaged in synaptic remodeling? And what we did to address this question is we, we leveraged the, um, the developing visual system as the model system, which is the circuit between the retinal ganglion cells of the retina that innervate the visual thalamus. 
And what we found is that the inputs from the two eyes shown here on the right, you can see blue and red. Normally they innervate early on the same neuron in the thalamus. So they're multiply innervated by both eyes. But then during this window of pruning, it's been shown by Carla Schatz, Chin Fei Chen and many others that there's a preferential loss of one eye over the other. And often that this is the less active input that gets pruned away. So we asked, could microglia tell which synapse is the weak or the strong? And in particular, are they preferentially engulfing the less active eye input? We could label the inputs, for example, with cholera toxin shown here, what, are, what I'm showing you here are the endings of the left and right eye axons or inputs into the visual thalamus. This is one microglia that's associating with all of the inputs from the two eyes. And what Dory showed through a series of, um, of, ex of experimental approaches that yes, microglia phagocytose are engulfed and essentially are nibbling off the endings of these axons, but they're doing so during a developmentally uh, critical period, a developmentally restricted critical period, the postnatal period of about postnatal day five to postnatal day 10, it's the peak of the pruning. And they do so in an activity dependent manner, meaning, they, if you block the activity of one eye versus the other, they preferentially engulf the less active eye input. And that data told us that there must be instructive signals that are telling the microglia which synapse to engulf and which ones to leave alone. And work by our group and now many others have gone on to show that there are a number of ways by which microglia that are actively surveying and dynamically surveying the brain environment, moving their processes around all the time, they can, by uh, virtue of the, the receptors they express and the combination of cues on synapses, they can essentially read out some of these cues. And those are the instructive signals that can tell the microglia which synapse to, to engulf in this case. So we've identified complement as one of those molecules or sets of pathways, but we similarly also um, identified other molecules as well. And one of the questions uh, more recently we've been addressing in, in, in collaboration with Michaela Mattioli's lab is that um, what tells the microglia not to engulf because not all of the synapses are, are, are removed. We've also shown that some of the ways that recruit microglia and complement to synapses is through a local phosphatidylserine flipping or exposure that then recruits some of these molecules to the synapses like C1Q, for example, or like microglia via uh, TREM2, which is a receptor on microglia. Um, but in addition to that, we think there may be an activity dependent regulation of this such that phosphatidylserine, this is work by Nicole Scott Hewitt in my lab, may be dynamically flipping out to the external uh, membrane and therefore recruiting some of these molecules in in an activity dependent manner. So this kind of brings back the work of, of that Dory uh, had generated data that she had generated a number of years before. Now, this is just a working model, as is this. And one of the ways we're thinking about all this is that maybe what's happening is that microglia are essentially reading out a combination of cues and that based on the combination and the receptors they express, they might preferentially engulf the less active inputs that are, let's say, tagged by eat me signals and phosphatidylserine, but they're prevented from engulfing the, um, the more appropriate synapses that are stronger because these molecules like uh, they have these don't eat me signals like CD47 that are telling the microglia don't engulf me. And much like the immune system where there's a combination of cues that tell a macrophage, okay, this is self versus non-self, so don't engulf healthy cells or self cells. We've actually shown that many of these molecules are also in the brain and they may serve similar roles to give the specificity. And in, in addition, not only have we have uncovered some of these don't eat me signals like CD47, We've also started to look at other molecules, including complement inhibitors that we think are also playing this role in preventing active, active aberrant activation of complement in the, in the healthy developing brain. And bringing that back to the genetics of schizophrenia, quite intriguingly, this gene called CSMD1 has, has basically has a well-localized GWAS signal for schizophrenia risk as, as well. Uh, this has been uh, identified for a number of years, although the function of CSMD1 is still largely unknown. And what's really interesting about CSMD1 is that it's a very um, abundant protein at the expressed highly both at the RNA level and at the protein level, but it's enriched in the brain. It's expressed at very low levels everywhere else in the body. So this is telling us that it may be some, you know, essentially a putative complement inhibitor in the brain 
This comes from some work by our collaborator that showed an interaction between CSMD1 and C4, um, and that it may be preventing the activation of the cascade, at least in vitro. And what uh, work uh, by Matt Baum, our MD-PhD student, and Matt Johnson in my group, in collaboration with Steve McCarroll and others, we have new data now uh, that shows that if you lo a loss of function of CSMD1 leads to an increased deposition of complement on, on, on uh, neurons, both in vitro and in vivo, and that this leads to increased synaptic engulfment and an enhanced synaptic refinement. So this, again, is a proof of concept uh, to show that this is a putative complement inhibitor, also nominated by the, the human genetic studies of schizophrenia, and together with the C4 uh, results I showed you before, suggests one model that could explain uh, some of the, this, uh, um, this data together in and in, in kind of brings back the work of Erwin Feinberg, meaning that perhaps different genetic um, uh, defects in either this complement inhibitor or in C4 itself could lead to over pruning or aberrant pruning that could ultimately perhaps lead to impaired synaptic connectivity. Now, this is, again, a working model, uh, certainly in no way explains all of schizophrenia or all of the phenotypes, but it's something based on the genetics and some of the biology that's giving us sort of a, a foot, foothold now to start to, to be able to tackle this and using multiple different approaches across our groups. And now we're in a position to generate new tools uh, in, in not only mice, but also non-human primate models and to start to relate this to the human data to better ask what the consequences are of this in terms of circuits and behavior. And another uh, a recent example that comes from Mike Carroll's group in a paper that was just published on this past year, what they showed in the mice that, that lack C4A and those that overexpress the risk variant of C4A is that there are actually a reduced synaptic density in these mice, including the prefrontal cortex, and that there's a decrease in synaptic spines in these mice. Again, uh, linking back to some of the work that might relate to some of those, um, those anatomical studies in schizophrenia. And also Mike's group has done some behavioral analysis of these mice and showed that human C4A overexpression in mice also alters behavior. Um, they're starting to run more detailed, uh, and we are also running more detailed uh, behavioral assays in these mice, but I think again shows an example where we can now build on this to try to better understand the consequences. And I think there's a number of questions raised by this work. Um, and in particular, we're better, we, we're kind of a well positioned now to try to understand how genetics and environment interact to increase risk of these disorders. And in particular, although we have a, certainly a, some genetic leads, we also want to better understand how environment, environmental challenge, um, in particular, challenges such as stress, social isolation, peripheral inflammation, how do those um, challenges impact synaptic connectivity and behavior? And now that we have a good sort of groundwork laid and some good animal models, I think we're in a position now to start to interrogate these, um, these environmental components and how this relates to the genetics, this idea of a double hit, which has also been proposed in the context of some of these disorders. And although a lot of the work I've told you today is focused on development, our work by our group and now others are also trying are also suggesting that some of the same immune related pathways that involve microglia and synaptic remodeling may be reactivated in the adult and age brain to drive or mediate pathological synaptic loss and cognitive decline in the context of um, age related disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. And this kind of brings back this idea that I brought up at the very beginning, which is that synaptic loss and dysfunction is a hallmark of many different brain disorders, um, ranging from developmental disorders to age related disorders, raising this question of could there be some common um, biology and common mechanisms. And I did focus a bit today in the first part of my talk on pruning, but I want to kind of in the next uh, part kind of zoom out a little bit to, to say that, you know, microglia do a lot of other things in the brain besides synaptic pruning and synaptic remodeling. And the other thing that I think is really opening up new areas of research in the field is emerging human genetics, much like I told you about schizophrenia, in the context of diseases like Alzheimer's, more and more evidence is more directly pointing to microglia and myeloid cells and brain relevant, brain resident myeloid cells and my macrophages in the context of Alzheimer's disease in particular. So while most of Alzheimer's disease is of late onset, 
Um, and certainly there's a smaller percent that's been large, that's been identified, um, you know, rare, rare uh, genes like presenilin-1 and, and, and APP. Most of Alzheimer's uh, can be explained by these common variants shown here in blue. Um, and it turns out as we continue to gather more of the genetic sequencing data and GWAS studies, almost half or more of those common variants are either expressed or enriched in myeloid cells and macrophages of the brain, um, including microglia. Even APOE, although expressed in lots of other cells, is also upregulated in microglia. So the field over the last uh, five or more years, more and more is starting to now kind of build on these genetic findings to try to better understand the underlying biology um, that uh, could explain why and how uh, micro, microglia and macrophages are, are, are involved and implicated in Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases that I'm not showing you here. And yes, uh, synaptic loss and dysfunction is an early component of, of a lot of these disorders. In fact, synaptic loss happens long before you start to get some of the, the pathological hallmarks of the disorder. Um, and so we wondered, for, for example, could microglia uh, you know, be involved in this early phase, in this very early phase of Alzheimer's disease using some of the same mechanisms I mentioned earlier. And we and others, including work by Morgan Chung's lab, indeed have shown that microglia can mediate early in pathological synaptic loss in these animal models of Alzheimer's disease and genetic deletion of complement, the various components I mentioned in the first part of my talk, um, can rescue some of these synaptic and cognitive defects in these mouse models. So that's quite, quite exciting. And then uh, work by others has also shown um, evidence of this microglia pruning pathway, not just in Alzheimer's, but in other disorders as well. Ex ex again, suggesting this could represent a common uh, a common mechanism. But again, microglia uh, have been implicated in many other functions as well. In fact, we know these cells change state and become quote unquote activated in a lot of different contexts in both brain injury and neurodegeneration and a lot of other disorders. They go from this highly ramified looking microglia that I've shown you here to one that has been observed in pathological samples and fixed brain tissue to look more like this. Uh, and so often the field terms this microglia activity or activation. But the big question really is when do these cells change state? How do they contribute to specific aspects of disease pathogenesis? And how do we better as a field define these different states of not only microglia within the brain, but also other brain associated macrophages and relate to in relationship to specific functions. So in the last uh, bit of my talk, I kind of want to put this uh, into perspective in terms of how we can how we can start to study and address some of these really challenging questions. And just say that one of the reasons why it's particularly challenging to address any of those questions is the fact that microglia and myeloid cells, uh, macrophages of the brain actually exist in you know, different states. And, and actually uh, these states can change dramatically based on their location and the context. And we know, for example, in the context of microglia from the, in, within the resident parenchyma of the resident microglia in the parenchyma of the brain, they undergo dramatic changes in microglia development, and um, they undergo a lot of different state changes across normal development. Uh, and then in the context of challenges, they can shift into these different states that are involved in inflammation, um, debris clearance, they can become more phagocytic, for example. And so uh, they can also lead to this excessive pruning, as I just mentioned before. But we really still lacked um, ways to define these state changes. And we are early days in really defining and characterizing um, markers that denote these different uh, transcriptional and, and functional states. Uh, so really, I think um, this is where many in the field are starting to go by applying single cell genomics and other approaches to try to study microglia states and function. And um, I think, you know, the old view, I know, a number of years ago was that they're either good or bad, right? They can, they can either shift to this bad state or there's a good state. But I think what we're starting to appreciate is that these cells are very dynamic. They exist in lots of different states. And it may look something more like this, um, that there's actually a, a sort of a multidimensional and dynamic aspect of these states that are transcriptomic is one element. Uh, but also there's a lot of other pieces that we need to put together to try to really define uh, what microglia states are 
and how that, that might relate to specific functions of microglia. Now, the transcriptomic states is one that we are now gaining a lot of data and insight from, from the field. And as an example, work by Ido and Mitz group a number of years ago uh, now was the first to identify a disease associated microglia signature or state based on single cell transcriptomic studies in both Alzheimer's mouse models and also in some human uh, uh, animal uh, brain samples. And this has been now shown by many other groups over the years, including our own, that indeed there's sort of a common signature that continues to emerge from these data sets that suggests that indeed microglia kind of shift into this disease associated signature when there's uh, a challenge, including an amyloid plaque, for example, in the context of Alzheimer's. But probably dams represent only one of many states and we still don't have a very good handle on whether dams are good or bad or both, depending on the context. Um, so how do we get there? How do we better define states? And how do we deal with the fact that these are often snapshots in time, right? We're getting one time point, whether that's human brain or a mouse model. Um, how do we better sort of map out almost in a longitudinal fashion, how these different states change over time? So about um, five years or so ago, uh, around the time that these studies were emerging, we decided uh, in my group in collaboration with Steve McCarroll's lab, maybe one way to think about this is to try to map microglia states across the lifespan of a mouse as a starting point to just better understand and define you know, how diverse and how dynamic are microglia states under normal conditions across the trajectory of life, right? From embryonic period all the way through to aging. And then under certain perturbations where we have more control. And work led by Tim Hammond and my group, um, and this is another study that was uh, published around the same time from Tony Weiss Corey and Ben Barris's lab, that ultimately showed that when we sequenced almost 77,000 microglia and purified them from the mouse brain um, across development into aging, we identified diverse populations or states as shown here by this TSNE plot represented here in the different colors that um, there are in fact a lot of heterogeneity and diversity of states under normal conditions. And if you look and zoom into any one of these colored clusters, a large number of, of, of um, differentially expressed genes that are enriched in those clusters, we're starting to nominate potential functions. And to us, this was exciting because it enabled us to start to connect the dots between transcriptomic states and then spatially, where do these cells reside? And then ultimately, what does that tell us about function so that we can develop new tools to manipulate and knock out not all microglia, but let's say the microglia in cluster four versus the rest of the microglia in the brain. And while we've been doing this in the context of um, mouse development, this just is uh, highlighting uh, the data just sort of all in one place. This is just showing a lot of diversity that we uh, observed were happening across development by normal healthy adulthood, the microglia resided largely in one big homeostatic state, we call it. Um, but then with aging, injury, and, and then as you'll see in disease, we can start to observe clear shifts into these different states. Um, we've actually uh, made a portal where a lot of this uh, data can be found if you're ever interested in, in, in looking in, your, in some of your favorite genes in these data sets. But even more excitingly now, since the work from many groups now are starting to generate similar data sets in not only animal models and mouse models and non-human primate models, but also human. And now the goal is to try to integrate all of these data sets together to try to understand better which states are conserved, which ones are unique to different paradigms. And I think it's a really exciting time to be starting to really think about connecting these transcriptomic data to understand function. This is just a summary of the data here. But really, in the last few minutes, I want to kind of go back to, you know, the no way is this explaining, you know, uh, it, it, all of the big challenges and the big questions that I that I put forth at the beginning, because we still don't know, even with this uh, emergence of new single cell data, uh, how dynamic are these states? Can they go back? Are they reversible? Are they really plastic? We haven't yet been able to track the same population or the same microglia over time to ask how dynamic they really are. We want to better understand what the functions of these different states or populations are that are emerging. And we want to then kind of apply some of the models I brought up at the beginning of my talk to try to better understand how genetic risk and environmental challenges are altering these states. And then ultimately, how can we faithfully model this in the context of human? And that is 
I think uh, where I want to end the last bit of my talk today uh, with some new unpublished work that kind of I, I hope starts to tell you a bit about how we're thinking about doing this. Um, and, and in particular, that the, the goal is to go from these different, you know, morphological states to transcriptomic states, epigenetic states, and ultimately try to link those states to different functions so that we can better ideally uh, target the detrimental uh, microglia states in the context of disease and try to reverse them back to a more beneficial state. Now, there's been a number of really exciting protocols and, par and paradigms to start to study and model human microglia. Um, and, and there certainly has been some evidence that although there's some conservation between genetic signatures and, and genomic data between microglia and human, um, there's also some differences. And so it's important uh, not only to study this in a mouse model, but also to start thinking about ways to better direct and uh, translate this to the human. So uh, a number of years ago, uh, there were a number of protocols uh, developed um, by, um, uh, by, by Matt Blurton Jones and, and many other groups. Um, and Rudy Yanish, there's kind of three or four protocols that, that emerged a number of years ago to develop and to grow microglia uh, and differentiate these uh, human stem cells into iPS microglia-like cells. And what's really cool about this is that you can, um, there's a lot more tractable ways to start to interrogate states if you can actually grow them in a more reduced system. And then the idea would be to be able to um, manipulate uh, and, and challenge these cells and then be able to track state changes over time, which is really challenging, of course, to do in vivo. And to be honest, when we thought, started thinking about this about uh, you know, two or three years ago, I was extremely skeptical that we could get to uh, address really complex questions like um, mapping state to function in, in vitro, because we know that if you take microglia out of the brain and put them in a dish, they lose all of their environmental signals. So how might we uh, be able to study something as complex as environmental context in a dish? However, we have um, decided to challenge that, uh, that question. And I'm gonna share with you now some work, uh, collaborative work ongoing with this team uh, uh, in collaboration with Kevin Egan, Evan McCosco, Ben Deverman, and, and, and others, including Matt Lerton Jones and Chris Glass, where our group is starting to try to develop a pipeline or a new platform for using these IPS microglia to really dissect out questions about states and function, and then map that back onto the human data sets and validate some of those findings. So you can toggle between the in vitro and the in vivo data to try to better close those gaps. And so this is all in published work, um, but the kind of to set the stage, we're really interested, especially as I mentioned in the context of Alzheimer's genetics, where we know there's a lot of uh, evidence pointing to microglia and specific genes like TREM2 and APOE and others, we really want to uh, leverage the, the genetic data to try to connect the dots between the genetics, specific states and specific functions, and then also introduce different environmental challenges. And bringing back the work of Ido Amit, again, that I mentioned before, what they found, not only do you get microglia disease-associated states, these dams, he also showed, and his group has shown over the years, and others have validated, that uh, part of the shift to this disease-associated state is dependent on a gene called TREM2, which is a receptor on microglia that has, has a number of important functions, including phagocytosis and probably other functions as well that Marco Colonna and others have, have, have observed. So we wondered, could we start to model uh, some of these changes in vitro? And so to do that, what we decided to do, and this is uh, work led by Martine Therrien and, and others in my team, what we decided to do is grow the microglia in vitro and then expose these microglia to different brain relevant challenges like apoptotic neurons, amyloid fibrils, different forms of amyloid, myelin debris, synaptosomes, things that the microglia would normally see in the context of a disease or degeneration. And then for the first time, to my knowledge, we performed a very large single cell sequencing experiment in a dish and ask how many states of microglia are they? Do they shift with different brain challenges? And then how do these states relate to the human brain? And so what I'm showing you on the right is on the untreated condition, we do observe some states, but there's a remarkable increase in the number and the robustness of these states when you expose the microglia IMGLs to these different brain relevant challenges. Not only that, uh, thanks to collaboration with Evan McCosco's group led by Tushar Kamath and, and, and work by Mike Dolan's group, 
we have now a large data set emerging from Evans Group where we were able to align a lot of the single cell sequencing data from the human brain, human cortex with and without amyloid and tau pathology with these IMGL data sets that I just showed you. And quite excitingly, we saw a, almost a complete alignment of all these different states shown here in colored numbers with those data that are also being generated from the intact, freshly isolated human brain. This is actually from surgical samples, so no, no postmortem artifact here. And what's exciting is we get a lot of alignment, but we also are seeing these populations that also suggest functions, chemokine sensing microglia, proliferating microglia, and even DAM, disease-associated microglia, that we're not only seeing in the human brain, but also seeing in these IPS models. So now we can start to say, well, all right, can we leverage this and start to really understand better what the function of these microglia populations are? For example, can we get DAM-like cells in a dish? Indeed, we see a population of these IMGLs that express markers like TREM2 and APOE, differentially upregulating these markers depending on the different challenge. So some are more robust than others, which is quite exciting. And there's a core signature of these disease-associated microglia that we're seeing across the different uh, models. So if we relate this back to data that's been published and also unpublished. So that's giving us markers that we can use to study in vitro. And also because we decided to you know, push this to, to try to understand function, we wanted to know whether we could also study a, a functional relevance of DAM. And so that's where we uh, not only do single cell sequencing, but we are starting to do a lot of functional assays. So we can measure phagocytosis, neuroinflammatory cytokines, their ability to move and, and, and move towards an injury site, for example. And in particular, phagocytosis is a clear function of microglia, and it's been shown that TREM2 is important in phagocytosis. And if you have a loss of function of TREM2, at least in animal models, that leads to a failure to clear amyloid or, or decrease in phagocytosis. So as a proof of concept, we were excited to see that in our IMGLs, uh, a cell line that lacks TREM2 not only has a decrease in their ability to phagocytose in apoptotic neuron, for example, but they also have a decrease in their ability to induce this dam-like signature. So now that we feel like this is a fairly robust finding, we've seen it across multiple cell lines, we're now in a position to start to scale this up, develop some screens, so we can start to probe a lot of the other risk genes and also start to look at you know, patient-related lines. And now, um, ultimately, the goal would be to start to relate and integrate these data from different models in human, animal models and, and some of these human related cell, cell models to try to really try to better understand what's conserved and what these signatures are telling us about specific functions, because we know that context and location matters a lot. And what I didn't have a chance to show today is it's obviously hugely important to also map this back on to, uh, to spatial information using SlideSeq and spatial transcriptomics, because in the end, the local environment is going to be really important in terms of telling us what these microglia or myeloid cells or macrophages are seeing in the context of these different challenges. So on my last slide, I just wanna end by saying that I think we're an exciting time in the field where we're now able to start to really connect the dots between some of the genetic findings with specific uh, states based on multi-omic approaches, not only single cell, but also epigenetic and proteomic approaches. And then ultimately the goal would be to try to link that to specific functions with the hope that identifying the disease associated populations, we might be able to develop new tools and approaches to track these specific disease associated populations and across multiple diseases. And that might also identify new biomarkers, both imaging and CSF and blood biomarkers, and also ultimately to develop new therapeutic targets that would target the relevant population of, of, of macrophages, not all the macrophages in the brain. And this, uh, we hope uh, as we continue to collect more data and collaborate across uh, many different approaches and, and groups, we can start to get a more holistic picture of microglia and myeloid cell states uh, in the context of health and disease. So I'll just end by thanking a lot of really amazing collaborators and support, as well as the human microglia in my lab that make all this work possible. So thanks so much, I'll stop sharing. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stevens. It was a really great talk. Um, we have uh, a lot of questions, so we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, 
I will, uh, I'll, I'll read them out, but if anyone wants to kind of uh, elaborate on what they wrote, then feel free to say so in the chat. Sure. So we have a couple of questions here from Shafi, who um, uh, asked a question near the beginning of the talk where you were talking about um, the human C4 alleles. Um, so they asked, firstly, what happens in human C4 deficiency? Is there any syndrome like what is seen with the mouse overexpression? And then regarding the complement deposition in the postmortem brain in schizophrenic patients, was that global or did it have any regional predilection within the brain? Great. Yeah, great question. So uh, it turns out that quite interestingly, I mean, D C4 and complement deficiency in general can lead to other disorders, including lupus. Uh, and so work that I didn't have time to tell you about today that's done by Mike Carroll and also Steve McCarroll. It turns out that lupus uh, and schizophrenia, there's actually at the genetic level, like almost opposite risk, right? Where C4A is increases risk of schizophrenia, but it turns out that's not the case for lupus. There's actually protection or like actually is not protective in the context of I mean, and not, not an increasing risk in the context of lupus. So uh, some very recent work by Steve, Steve McCarroll and other, uh, other groups are starting to try to parse out what the differences are in terms of uh, the peripheral component of this. And, and I think that's gonna be important to try to better understand the C4 deficiency in the context of, of the brain side as well as the peripheral side of things. Um, because in no way the work that I showed with you at the beginning of my talk today does that in any way explain everything can be explained in the brain? There could still be a lot of examples by which C4 genotype, right, or copy number could also lead to aberrant peripheral changes in the, in the periphery that could then indirectly alter the brain. Um, in terms of the region specificity, this is a big question. Region specific vulnerability, region spe specific vulnerability and specificity is something we're super interested in understanding. We haven't really gotten and dissected that out super carefully yet, but of course now these animal models that we're generating is gonna give us a tractable way to start to do that, it's work in progress, but also human. It's harder to get those brain samples from different brain regions. And even on those early studies by David Lewis that's measured spine loss, yes, they've looked in frontal cortex, but in no, no way does that explain the frontal cortex is the spot, right? I think it could be a much broader um, uh, potential um, circuit level changes that are happening in the context of these neuropsychiatric disorders. And synapse loss could be caused, could be downstream, right? Not certainly not necessarily going to be upstream. So, so we have a lot more to do is the bottom line. I don't have an answer to that question, but I think now we're in a good position to kind of build on some of the foundational work. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so yeah, then it, there's a, a couple of questions actually here from uh, Pedro Nugaire who asks, um, can C4 knockout microglia influence the production of gliotransmitters and can they affect astrocyte activity? Yeah, excellent question. I uh, don't know the answer directly to that question, but I think you bring up another point that I definitely glossed over in my talk in the interest of time, which was I was laser focused on microglia and, and in some, to some extent uh, mac brain macrophages uh, in my talk, but astrocytes and other glial cells are intimately associated with, with these microglia. So a primary defect in microglia um, can alter any of those cells and the signaling between those other cell types or vice versa. You know, an insult or defect in neurons or astrocytes can then kind of signal back to the microglia. So I guess, you know, if I, if I were to generalize, I'd say that uh, it could go either way. And you really want to start to think about how this, the dynamic crosstalk in signaling between neuron glia interactions and neural amine interactions is altering not just one cell type, but all the cell types in the circuit, including astrocytes. And I think this is an emerging theme, both in neuroimmune interactions and neuron glia interactions. And an example is there's a lot of the single cell data that's emerging now where you can start to um, look at, you do nuke seek and look at all the cells, right? Across, not just within the brain, but at the brain borders and, and even in the periphery. That can enable you to nominate new receptor ligand interactions that could then allow you to ask these questions in different genetic backgrounds. So I think that's that's kind of where we're headed. And I think many in the field are starting to go that direction as well. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, uh, yeah, then here one uh, from uh, Rudra who asks, is there evidence of whether stress hormones can directly or indirectly recruit microglia for synaptic remodeling? 
Great question. Uh, we're very interested in understanding the stress hormone part and also, you know, male versus female uh, sex potential sex differences and some of the things I told you about today. Also, probably not uh, probably many of you are thinking about this. This period of adolescence is a lot of obvious changes that are going on with hormones. And uh, and so we really want to better understand uh, the, the relationship between some of these signals and the timing. Uh, so these, these are, these, I don't know the answer, but I think this is a, another, I think, area that's ripe uh, for, for investigation to try to better understand that this relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a question here from Francis, who says, great talk. The P4 slash 5 to P30 tone plot differences, I guess the T's and E, are dramatic. Uh, do the transcriptomes map on to changes in microglia function at those different ages? Yes, great. Thank you. I cut I cut that part of the talk out for the interest of time, but if you look up uh, our work, the Hammond paper that I, I cited, what we in the lab is now doing is for each of those, picture the Tisney with all those different colors, uh, each of those uh, have a list of you know 10 to 15 genes that are nominating potential functions. For example, the pink clusters were proliferation. And if you look back at those genes and then spatially map it back on, you can indeed find those clusters that are, are, are suggesting those are the proliferating microglia that help to you know colonize the brain during early development. Similarly, these chemokine expressing microglia, we can do spatial mapping, find them in the brain, and similarly, that's nominating a developmental and spatially relevant population. So for each of those populations, we're now uh, actively developing new tools to knock out specific genes in each of those signatures and then ask what the functional consequences are for different developmental or other brain relevant um, you know, functions. And I think that's really the next step is like digging into that data, seeing what it might mean in a more unbiased way, but then ultimately what we need is to develop new tools to knock out not just one gene, but groups of genes that might regulate these different states so that we can start to systematically ask what these states are doing. And even though I said that the, most of the diversity was development and then they were largely in this homeostatic one big cluster, right? Well, I, I neglected to say that we ground up microglia from the whole brain at that time but work from the many in the field now are starting to unveil, not surprisingly, that depending on the brain region, you're also potentially gonna get diversity within a circuit or within a brain region. So now you can dissect out different brain regions across time. And I think we're gonna get even more complexity and heterogeneity, but depending on the local brain environment. And there's a lot of work that's now published or unpublished that, that you can find that suggests that I probably oversimplified that as well, but it's a, it's, it's a good start because a lot of data is emerging in the field to, to build on. Yeah, that's great. We actually had a couple of questions here about um, whether the different transcriptomic, transcriptomic states of the microglia are brain region dependent. And for example, Asya here asks whether you think that different profiles of microglia will be localized together and then whether there's differences between brain areas. As you just yeah, mentioned. you know, I, while you're on that, is related to that same question or questions that might have come up. Um, the other thing I just wanted to highlight was, um, and maybe some of you are thinking this, uh, maybe maybe you were wondering this, but microglia, a lot of the pruning work that I told you about in terms of specificity of synapses that they're engulfing versus not engulfing, that was pretty much all excitatory synapses. Um, and a lot of our work was on the presynaptic axonal side. But what is now also emerging, and I want to highlight a paper that was just accepted for publication in Cell by uh, a work by Gord Fischel's lab uh, that we've collaborated with them on this project and others are starting to show the same, but microglia can also recognize inhibitory synapses and that there are different cues that might be telling the microglia to engulf inhibitory connections versus excitatory. So the specificity in terms of within a circuit inhibitory excitatory connections and then even within right within the brain different brain regions so i think there's a lot more that we don't know but i think now we're, we've got a handle on how to go about some of those questions so so stay tuned for for that 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 paper that should come out sometime in july mm -hmm. okay so we have a lot more interesting questions here maybe i'll just ask i'm sorry we don't have time to get to all of them but i'll, I'll ask one last one uh, here from tiago coelho who, are, who says, fantastic talk, Beth. Do you know if a single microglia cell can present two or more of these different phenotypes simultaneously and how transient are the different states? I love that question. That is like, the, that's a great question to end on because 
What we don't yet know, and to my knowledge, no one has tracked the same microglia over time after a challenge, let's say. So that is one of the reasons why we decided to put the effort into this um, IPS microglia system, because that would enable us if it, a more tractable approach to being able to give a, a systematic challenge, watch the same microglia over time. That could be over minutes or hours or even longer and develop reporters for different states. Like mm -hmm. let's imagine, okay, that we found a state of dam with a reporter that went up when dams were activated. And then another reporter, let's say the chemokine microglia. And then we could track the same microglia over time. That would enable us to ask about multiple states and also how dynamic are they? Do they go back or once you are a dam, you're always a dam. Um, we don't know the answer to that, but I think that's to me where we're headed. And that also means tool, new tool development and new generation. And one of the bottlenecks, may, 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 many of you may know, is that microglia and myeloid cells in general are incredibly resistant to viral AAV infectivity. Uh, and that's been, a, while that's interesting biologically for lots of reasons, it's been a big challenge for tool development. So coming up with new approaches to develop either transgenic or other tools to manipulate states and watch states, I think it's gonna be really important uh, moving forward. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, that was a good point to, to end on. Again, sorry we didn't have time to get to all of the questions, but if you're interested in continuing the discussion, we're going to um, switch over now to the meet the speaker session, which will be a smaller sort of informal chat. Um, so uh, we'll be there for the, um, yeah, let's meet there in like two, three minutes. Okay. Um, and uh, I hope we'll see several, several of you then. Uh, in the meantime, thanks again to Dr. Stevens for joining us. Uh, thanks to all of you for, for tuning in. Um, we're really happy to see so many people here. And uh, don't forget to join us next week when we'll have Professor Stephen O'Rahili uh, from the University of Cambridge uh, joining to talk to us about the genetics of obesity, uh, which will be a really fantastic talk. So thanks yeah. again. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining in. And thank you so much, Sam, for, for inviting me and for hosting. Take, really appreciate Pleasure. it. Take care.